Well, thank you very much for having me. Um, after hearing the previous speakers, I mean, I've created some slides and then I, um, I've just listened to some pretty inspirational talks and I've thought, actually, I need to up my game a little bit, don't I? Let's just enable some editing, start a slideshow. Oh, here we go. What have we done? I know why, there's a bit of media in it for some fun. So yes, good evening, uh, I'm Barney Stevenson. It's a slightly unusual name, I know, um, but that's me. Uh, and so I am a registrar in, I've got to say the right words to keep the training programme committee happy. A general surgeon primarily, because that's what I'm being trained for, but with a specialist interest in HPV and liver transplantation. And we'll talk about what some of those letters mean in a minute. So, HPV transplant, what does it mean? So the H is, uh, as it says there, hepato pancreatico biliary. Now, unfortunately, it's not a great Scrabble score, but it does mean we get to do quite a bit of interesting work. Um, and I think hopefully this is a pointer, if I'm lucky. Maybe not. Don't fire it at yourself. Good. Um, so, I, so I'm training to deal with basically anything to do with the liver, the, the hepato part. The pancreatico bit is your, ex, is your endo and exocrine gland there, the pancreas. Um, and to do anything to do with bile ducts, really, and that includes anything from your gallbladder just here, so lots of gallstones and gallstone-related disease, um, and then you've got your, your anatomy is not quite right, actually, well, it kind of is, um, to any, and anything else distal to that, really, uh, and a bit proximal, so hepatic ducts, common bile ducts, and we do a little bit of kind of duodenal work as well. So anything really in that region, um, and it is, malignant disease we're talking about and benign disease and most commonly the benign stuff really is to do with gallstones deal a lot with pancreatitis as well which can be down to gallstones and um, as well as those that like the odd tipple or two of quite a reasonable amount of alcohol and on the malignant side we talk we're in the liver we're talking more about colorectal liver metastases so that's a big part of our workload um, and in the gallbladder Gallbladder cancer is reasonably rare, and cholangiocarcinoma is reasonably rare, but not, but uh, certainly exists, keeps um, helping to pay the bills. Um, and then we talk about pancreatic cancer. And pancreatic cancer is a big thing, and it's getting worse, and it's got terrible outcomes at the moment. So again, that keeps us occupied. What does the next bit mean? Transplants. Okay, so... Um, in the middle of the night, uh, I will sometimes get a telephone call, um, not whilst I'm here at the moment at UHCW, um, but when I've been down the road um, last year and, and the year coming up, and hopefully the few future, I might get a telephone call in the middle of the night from a, from a, a coordinator, a transplant coordinator. Um, and there's a whole series of them. Some of them will be out in the middle of nowhere, like a place like Havisham, Havisham West, which is in the tip of Wales, or where else have I been? Down to Plymouth and Derriford hospital, all the way to kind of Buxton, you name it, we can go there. And there'll be someone there who is either dying or is dead. And they are about to give the ultimate gift, which is to save someone else's life. And because they're an organ donor, and some of you might be organ donors already. And if you're not, I'd strongly encourage you to consider it. Um, anyway, so they have made a decision, or their loved, their loved ones have made a decision on their behalf that they'd like to give this gift of life to someone else um, through donating their organs. And so there's a little team of us, and they're about, there are probably about 10 teams around the country, and every night you, you go to bed, uh, and there'll be, lots of, there'll be lots of these vans floating, uh, driving, sometimes reasonably quickly, and with blue lights on, we'll go off to, this, off to a hospital and we'll go and retrieve that individual's, that donor's organs. Um, now we split that up into cardiothoracic side of things, that's a separate team, and I'm more of the abdominal team. So I'll be involved with retrieving livers, kidneys, and pancreases from some blood vessels that sometimes help us out. And then most of the time, and that can be either through someone who's brain stem dead, or someone who's died in the more conventional manner from a cardiorespiratory death. Anyway, so we work uh, reasonably quickly and, and get those organs out, pop them onto, into ice, although we can talk about that a little bit later. Um, and then transport them back to one of a number of different transplant centres. And the way we decide upon where organs are going to go are based upon the donor, the potential recipient, blood types, and what we call matching. And the matching varies depending upon whether 
uh, we're talking about a liver transplant or a kidney transplant or a kidney pancreas transplant. Um, and not every region has transplant, uh, has liver transplant centres or pancreas transplant centres, certainly the Western Midlands doesn't, um, but we've got Oxford down the road and Cambridge and Newcastle. Um, but then most regions or deaneries have got kidney transplant centres. And so we'll bring these various organs back to their respective recipient transplant centres and then we'll start plumbing them in. And then hopefully what we do is we take organs, uh, sometimes they look like that. Oh, sorry, on the right that's a nice shiny uh, liver with a nice sharp edge, uh, looks pretty good. But quite a bit of the time we'll get horrible fatty ones like this. Um, but either way, we'll make an assessment of whether that those livers or, or those particular organs can be transplanted. And hopefully, if we're lucky, I can't show you the picture of what he looked like before he had a transplant because it's a bit too disturbing. Um, but ultimately, yeah, he had, a, he had a liver transplant. In fact, he was part of a trial in which we took that liver, basically, or something that looked very similar to that, and popped it onto a machine to make it to, to make it to see if we could make it work, which we did. And then he was the first one to get one in the world. So, um, and he looked pretty good. Uh, and he's got his life back uh, to the extent he's gone back into business in the broadest sense of the term, which even in the papers they term import export. <laughs> <laughs> Her Majesty's pleasure. Anyway, so, um, so a little bit about my, what my training and what I've done to date. So, um, before medical school, which was at the other one down the road, um, I was, uh, yeah, I'm from Dorset originally, so I'm a, a bit of a country lad. Uh, hence the jumper and the corduroy probably. Um, and then at the age of 19, I, I came up to Birmingham uh, in 1998 uh, and stayed all the way through for the millennium and all that kind of stuff. So six years. And during that time, uh, I did a reasonable amount of work. Um, what I really enjoyed from med school was the SSC stuff, so your special projects. And the reason why I really enjoyed that was because I was allowed to think. And I was a, that was my first opportunity, I felt, that I could really explore things that I was interested in and start problem solving. Um, and when I got to my, after I'd done a couple of years of preclinical stuff, I then chose to do an intercalated uh, degree, which was, in some, which was in physiology, which was, I think I took out some rat brains and something like that. But anyway, it was good fun. And then I qualified, and in those days, I was the last year to do the old system of the pre-registration house officer, which I did at the Queen Elizabeth. Um, they were four-month jobs, though, and so very, in that sense, very similar to what the foundation year programme does. Um, didn't quite have the portfolio things, but it was starting to creep in. And I started, and during medical school, I wasn't quite sure what I wanted to do. I toyed with lots of different things, because I'd enjoyed quite a lot, particularly during the clinical years. I'd enjoyed, I thought about trauma and orthopaedics. I thought about, I got quite a long way into anaesthetics and the intensive care side of things because I've been involved with basic life support and that kind of stuff that um, Professor Perkins, who you might have met from here, he was involved with. Um, and then I got, I got through to the end and then I went to Hereford for my final year surgery placement and I loved it. It was the summer, they hadn't, they got a new hospital but they hadn't sorted out accommodation. So they rented, they, the, the medical school had rented a couple of houses out. So there we were, middle of summer, Walking down to work, nice countryside, I thought, yeah, this is the life. Go in, do some, basically ran, kind of half run the wards, um, got to theatre a bit to see what that was all about and thought, actually, I'm, I'm quite enjoying this. So it wasn't long after that, I didn't really like Robson and Guiney, even though my dad had done it. Um, and uh, anyway, so I thought by the end of that, and I did colorectal surgery as my first job, and I thought, right, that's it. It's, gen it's surgery for me. I did some endocrine, I did an endocrine house job, and during that time, um, we got a patient who most of the time was all about alcoholics and giving them some kind of withdrawal medication. And, um, but we also did some work with, uh, for pheochromocytoma patients and working them up. Um, and they had their operations by the liver unit over at the QE, and I was at Selly at the time, so just down the road. And I said, well, can I follow this patient up? Can I go and see what that was all about? And he said, yeah, of course, come on. So I popped over. And there I saw, started seeing big cuts livers moving things around I thought actually this this might be quite this might be quite good fun and then i went there for my last house officer job and that was it i knew from that moment onwards that i wanted to do hpv and transplantation and i fully put my hands up i've been very very lucky um, in that respect of knowing what i wanted to do very early on but when i was in your position it was all up in the air so i did the living unit job 
and that was a mix of liver medicine, so hepatology, um, and not just your alcoholics, but you see all kinds of weird, wonderful things like hemochromatosis, your acutely decompensated liver diseases from hepatitis, all kinds of stuff, which is great. Um, paracetamol overdose and so on, seronegative hepatitis that works. And then also during that job, I did liver surgery as the house officer. So again, I got to see all these things we were talking about before. So patients who are coming in for big cuts have half their liver taken out, either whether it be the left side, the right side, new livers put in, you name it. Um, anyway, after that, I went on to do, at that time, the change was starting to come in. So the, I did a pilot foundation year two, which was kind of the immediate predecessor to what you will do in the future. And I was lucky again, because I still stayed in the QE, and I went on to the live, basically the liver unit ITU. So I had eight months of, being, of seeing all these liver patients. Then I went on to do some A&E, and then general practice, and then after that, it, the, um, I went on to what the consultants here would have said, your second year SHO post, I did some urology, some vascular, breast, TNO, which were all good fun. Um, I didn't particularly enjoy the trauma of the penis. And then a bit more change came along. Um, the government has this habit of changing the training system every so often, and uh, we'll talk about that more at the end in terms of registrar training. Hopefully this won't change too much again, but at that time it was... Right, everyone's going to move around a little bit more because um, we've just changed the way training works and it's this new, more streamlined structure. And so I'm sorry that hasn't come out quite clearly, but I got sent to the Northern Dignity, to Middlesbrough of all places. Um, that's about right, it used to take about three hours and there were always lots of road works and I'd do a weekly commute up there and back because I'd still got my well, other half of the time. She was living there and got family there, but I was up there working, so I used to do that bit. And Middles Middlesbrough was great because uh, I did some breast and upper GI surgery, um, but it's something like the largest DGH in terms of floor space in Europe. It's got every special, specialty on site apart from transplantation, um, and I waited the time. And I did that um, for that ST2 period. Now at that time I was very lucky because I'd done, if you like, the ST3 interviews. They brought those back earlier a year, and so it was a run-through post. So I basically um, then had a registrar number, um, and I hung around, did some vascular surgery, and then what hasn't shown up there is I went from Middlesbrough to North Allerton. So I went from the largest DGH in Europe to the smallest DGH in England, um, which was a bit of a shock, but it was very good for me because I had that those differences of being having a massive team around me of registrars and other SHOs. Um, uh, and then I got put into a much smaller place where I was given a bit more freedom to you know, get on with the job and really try and take a bit of, can try and take on more of the management really of, of patients on a day-to-day -day basis. Yes, the boss was around, of course. Um, so I did that for six months and then I went back to Middlesbrough uh, for, I hadn't realised, have you been watching, what was it, MasterChef? Some guy went on for a chicken parmo, which is a local delicacy of Middlesbrough, which is basically deep fried chicken with lots of cheese in it, bechamel cheese, anyway. So um, I went back to borrow some chicken parmo and then did some more um, general surgery with colorectal and vascular. Then at that time, similarly to Ruth, I knew that I wanted to do research. And even though I was up in the uh, Northern Dean, I've been keeping, I've just been keeping in contact with people back at the QE um, and saying, well, I'm quite interested in I'll be quite interested in doing research, I've only posts coming up and so on. And so at that time, um, they said, yeah, we have got one coming up. Do you fancy applying for it? Now, I was very, when I did all that, uh, I was planning ahead, exactly like my, my uh, senior colleagues have mentioned. And I only applied to deaneries where I knew they had liver transplant centres. So I was just thinking those two or three years ahead. Um, so that's why I went to Northern Deanery. But actually, for a whole variety of circumstances, um, to do with my uh, father and so on, I basically did something called an interdeanery transfer. So I could be basically halfway between Middlesbrough and Dorset. Um, and so I had an interdeanery transfer straight to out of programme research. Um, and so that's what I did. And in the first, uh, what, almost 18 months, I generated some preliminary data. And this is where I realised kind of what hard work really was. So at that time, I was generating some preliminary data, getting used to pipettes and stuff like that. 
I was also doing two out of three weekends on call for this NORS thing, which is that National Organ Retrieval Service. And I was doing a couple of ward nights every three weeks um, on the liver surgery unit. That's certainly motivation to get funding. <laughs> because when I was fortunate enough to get some funding, I could come off that rotor and I went onto a renal surgery rotor. So I was still involved with transplantation, but on a kind of one in seven and allowed to do plenty of research and to do, allowed to do all of my research for another three years, which was great. Um, and then in terms of research, think about the old uh, things, but in terms of research, they were really at that time, and it's, it's the same back then, it's the same now, and it's going to be the same for the future, because the Medical Research Council and the Wellcome Trust and all the funders talk about three things. What you're like as a person, that's buffing your portfolio up even from now. The place, choosing where you want to do that research, and the people, so I was very fortunate enough to have someone called Professor Adams, and he was the chap really that described leukocyte trafficking in liver sinusoids. Had Simon uh, Afford and clinically Simon Bramwell and Professor Merza. And that was great fun. And he also talked about the project, and that time, <laughs> I was going to do something about stem cells because that was really sexy. Um, but what ended up happening um, was something very, very different. Um, and it, but it was still to do with livers, and it was actually to do with that gentleman we were talking about earlier. What I was really hoping was this was going to play, but it's not. Um, so basically what we've got here is my project ended up being taking these livers that you'd normally put in the bin, um, because either largely they were too fatty, really, that we couldn't normally use them. So normally in transplantation, you get these organs. We know from experience and databases and an and expert opinion what's going to work and what's not going to work. But we've got, at that time anyway, we didn't really have a way of quantifying it with what you've got something in front of you. So I took these livers and, and that we'd normally chuck in the bin, pop them onto this machine, pop some blood through them, some, some uh, old blood through them, added a few bits and pieces, um, put it to a 37 degrees, and then just did some measurements. And that was hoping, to, I was hoping to show that was going to, um, and then we test viability tests and work out if they worked or not, and then we eventually transplanted them. So that was great, that was a great period of time when it worked. Um, I think probably the thing I'd say the most is actually during that time, I learned three things. I learned a huge amount about the science and what I was meant to be researching both in the first place and what I ended up doing, and that's a very common thing to happen. I learned a lot about myself, um, just because there were lots of things going on. My dad wasn't very well, um, and there were a number, you know, you get to, you do go through your training and these personal things crop up. There's some very happy things that happen, so most of my colleagues got married. Um, and then there are some other things that do happen that are not so happy. But during that time, if, when you're in clinical, often you're racing along and you're just trying to keep up with life. But during the research side, yeah, you get to know how, what you're like as a person. And then most importantly, you find out about other people. Um, the vast majority of it is very friendly, which is good. So it just kind of makes you a bit more worldly. And then in 2015, I came back to the training programme um, and I went to Little Old Walsall. Um, which is yeah, just to the just to the northwest of Birmingham, um, and I did general and colorectal for four months just to get me back in synchronisation with everybody, and then I had a year of gastrointestinal surgery, so a mixture of upper GI and colorectal, and then up until October last year, I then as part of the deanery rotation went to the QE to do my f actually when you think about it, that was my first experience as a registrar doing HBB in transplantation. Um, so I did that for a year, and then I'm over at, at, in, at uh, UHCW now, again doing the HPV side of things, with, there's kidney transplantation but not liver, um, and then a few things to do, I just sort of some courses and that wretched thing called an exam. So when you look towards the future, I'm just going to pop that on, onto that for a moment, um, look, for the future for me, um, is a kind of, there's some specifics, like I've got to pass this exam, <laughs> that's given me palpitations already, um, and I've got to make sure I'm competent at doing all kinds of things, and I'll need to think not just what I want to do next year, which hopefully is going to be at the QE, but also I'm trying to think a couple of steps ahead, um, which is something I've always done, as in, where am I going to go, so like a fellowship, whether it be to Toronto or wherever, um, and then I think about a job. In the meantime, there's a whole host of other things. You've got audits, you, you guys know all this, 
again, more research, writing papers, teaching, management, and then thinking about kind of something a bit extra about of what I'm going to be able to offer, hopefully, a future employer. And all of this is related to this, this surgical curriculum. Um, and the teaching, the deanery teaching today actually is talking about change. And we always, we always like to talk about change. Um, and it's going to, the, the, what I would say is systems change. This, and largely they go around in big circles. Um, and we're probably approaching that again. We're going to might head more towards something that perhaps I mean, my consultant colleagues here experience. So, but don't be afraid of it. Change is not necessarily a bad thing. Um, David asked me to talk about hobbies, all right? This is what I used to do and what I've got interest in. I quite like the garden at home. Um, I've got a whole load of books, not read any of them. Um, I'm quite keen on computing and statistics and coding and stuff, which is a bit geek, you know, that's, I do do a bit of that. Um, holidays, I'd love one. Um, I quite, I was having a laugh with one of my friends who said, um, I took the mickey out of them, because they said, all I do is um, read books, Netflix, and wine. <laughs> um, and I'm not too dissimilar, actually. Uh, I, can't, I used to be a reasonable runner, actually. Um, and I occasionally go jogging. And I've got my mum. <laughs> so, um, and I think the point of this, of what I'm trying to say, is you've got choices. Um, and I've made a decision about what I want to do for the future. Yes, hopefully one day I'm still going to be able to get, I do need to go and go on the actually. Um, but I'll be able to do some of those things again. So I do try and keep up with a bit of running and so on. But ultimately, at the moment, I've got to focus on one thing. And I think probably that's the thing to say to all of you is that, yes, absolutely, think those steps ahead for all of your aspirations. Um, I've, but I've heard on a number of occasions, but you've got to keep focused on what you want to do. And so always have not only a strategic plan, but think tactically as well, okay, just to get you to the next bit. So, um, crikey, there are lots of things that I want to say, but yeah, I mean, I'm tr I, um, I qualified in 2004, uh, which is a long time ago, but so be it. I just reiterate what all the other speakers have said. It's a highly rewarding job. You, I mean, I personally feel that transplantation in particular is because I'm taking the giblets out of one person, if you like, and popping them to another, and they work, and the patient gets better. But for surgery as a whole, it's highly, highly rewarding. There's some fantastic opportunities. We're at the kind of this new age in terms of research side. Ruth would hopefully would agree with me and say, look, we're going into that stratified medicine, heading towards personalised medicine, things you might hear about, like CRISPR, and all that kind of gene editing stuff. Actually, you know what? By the time you're stood here, probably will be a reality. And you actually might be the ones who can influence that. Um, and that's the future bit. We've got to make some choices. Hopefully, from what you've heard this evening, um, you'll be inspired to actually take up the mantle. It would be lovely to see you in a few years' time. When you go, oh yeah, you that bloke who, um, who stood up at the front you've got slightly less hair now than you had even back then. <laughs> and that to me would be a compliment. All right. Thanks very much.